Let's tape forever. Here's your weekly dose of relationship fuel with Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about seeking mental health care support through your GP, the benefits of proactive health care, and how you can best support your partner if they are struggling with their mental health. But before we dive into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? It's birthday week. It is. Yes. Yeah. So, I had my birthday earlier in the week. Uh, It fell on a Monday, so Mm. not the best day for a birthday, but I had a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah. It started with uh, sunrise at the beach with some very dear friends and a little picnic and coffee, which was perfection. Then I kind of had just like a normal work day with um, lots of special deliveries of flowers and goodies, which made me feel very loved. Um, And then we had a really nice date night as well. So I think that's what's been fueling me up the most this last week. Yeah. What about you, Nate? Uh, Well, I guess for your birthday pre-weekend, we had one of your friends or one of our friends come and stay. (laughs) Yes. I'm very lucky that Sydney Gay Lesbian Mardi Gras Festival um, generally falls over the top of um, my birthday, and it did. So, my birthday is a very close second to what fueled me up being celebrating the Mardi Gras parade, um, getting all dressed up and having, like, possibly, I reckon, the best parade-watching experience that I've had, and I've been going for a decade. Yeah, that was my fuel up, too. So, um, going to the Sydney Mardi Gras and watching the parade and just seeing every different walk of life and just really having that reminder that there is a group for everything. There is a place for you to fit in. And yeah, it's such a beautiful celebration of love. So that really did fill me up. But now let's dive into this week's app. Today, we've got Dr. Shiromi joining us. She's a leader in change and innovation, and she serves as the founder and CEO of The Cloud GP, a GP-led online self-directed mental health program. As a Monash University medical graduate and fellow of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, she has had over 15 years of medical experience and has completed further training in psychological strategies. Dr. Shiromi is a dedicated mental health GP who firmly believes in the value of proactive healthcare, sorting things out before they hit the crisis point. Her passion lies in embracing innovation and technology to help people get across the mental health care when they need it, allowing them to achieve their full potential and live their very best life. Welcome to the show, Shiromi. Thanks so much for having me. It's exciting to be here. This is a biggie, right? Yeah, it's a biggie. (laughs) So thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you do and uh, the intersection between healthcare and technology is something that I think we're just going to see more and more of. Um, But I'm really excited to have this conversation because there's a reason that you got interested in this space and I think that's where we should start. How did you get interested in mental health? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. Um, So like you said, I went to Monash and I got into the GP training program pretty quickly. And that's because GP offers this beautiful medicine where we get to see people over a prolonged period of time. There's a continuity of care. We don't get to see them just for the moment that they have a broken leg. We get to see them over their life. We get to see them meet new people, form relationships, start new jobs, all of that. And as I was doing my GP training, I fell in love with mental health because And especially early intervention mental health, I should say. So people coming in to see us when they first start to experience symptoms because when we improve mental health and wellbeing, we improve someone's life, full stop. You know, mental health permeates into, you know, the symptoms that we can talk about from a medical point of view, but it also permeates into relationships, into work productivity, into someone's um, sense of self and how they feel about life. So if we can help people turn things around and feel good, everything around them improves, which is why I love mental health. Um, Over the years, I was finding that a lot of people were coming in presenting for depression and anxiety quite far down the line. So they're presenting at crisis point. They're not presenting early. They're presenting when their relationship is on the rocks and they're heading in for a divorce, when they've been called in by the boss for a performance review and they're maybe going to lose their job or when they lost it with their kids and just life is crumbling. Uh, And that breaks my heart because I know as a GP, there is so much that we can do to help. Um, There is hope and we can turn things around. I see it happen every day at the office. And I found myself thinking, bugger, I wish this person had come in sooner. There's a lot of stigma around mental health and that's why we created an online self-directed program that people can do from the comfort of their living room if they're feeling a bit overwhelmed to come in. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, I love that we share that about that proactivity piece. And that was a really big reason that Nathan and I started the Date Forever podcast was that we were looking for proactive relationship education and, and skill development before things get <laughs> rocky, before you hit turbulence. Um, and we really couldn't find very much. Um, there was a lot available for like the dating and finding your person. Um, and then there's a lot for like after you've um, potentially like just had kids and your relationship has changed a bit or it's tarnishing and it's not meeting your expectations or what you thought your relationship was going to be. But there's very little for like, hey, I found my person. I want this to be great forever. How do we do that? Um, so yeah, we're all about that proactivity piece, um, and living, yes, intentionally. So can you tell us a little bit about what you've created? Um, because I know that there is a a really big issue in a, particularly in Australia, probably globally, but I can talk more about Australia, um, and accelerated issue even more since the global pandemic about being able to access healthcare around mental wellbeing and mental health. Yeah, for sure. So we know about wait times. Everyone knows about wait times to see a psychologist. You can go into the GP and you can get a mental health care plan, which is a piece of paper to give you some subsidised sessions to see a psychologist or a mental health care plan provider. And in the city, you might be looking for a wait time of, you know, three to four weeks. Sometimes it's longer. Head out regionally and you can be waiting months, months and months on end, up to three to four months. And you know, we often look at mental health as something we don't need to move on quickly, but that's not the case at all. With mental health, If we don't move quickly, then the disengagement will come into play. So the overwhelm, the self-doubt can come into play and people can actually retreat back after all their hard work in approaching us and, you know, reaching out for help and go, this is too hard. And then we see them much further down the line when they are very, very unwell, if we see them at all. So that's not what we want. So effectively, this program is for someone ideally who has gone to see the GP. They've been diagnosed for the first time with depression or anxiety And then they've called the psychologist up and they've told them, oh, you've got like a X number of week wait to see someone and they're twiddling thumbs. Mm -hmm. That's not a situation I want anyone to be in. It frustrated me so much as a clinician because it takes so much courage and bravery for you to come in to see me in the first place. Often you're at crisis point and you wanted this solved yesterday. So the idea of having to wait is just the worst thing in the world to hear. Yeah. So this program is all the stuff that I've been doing in GP land with my patients to keep them well and scoring goals between getting that diagnosis and seeing the psychologist Mm. because that's what we want. We want to, you know, get accelerated progress. We want you to, when you hit the psychologist's rooms, to have done the 101 already so you can deep dive into the individualised care. So the program is uh, online. It's self-directed. It's short. So you can do it within three days. I didn't want to create a (laughs) eight-week-long mastermind because that is just too much for people and they retreat if you you know, while they've got everything on their plate, if you suggest something, it's too much. So it's a short course. I'm I'm talking like an hour, an hour and a half a day. So you could pretty much smash it out in the weekend if you were keen beans to get things moving. The first consult is all about understanding depression and anxiety, understanding what it is, how it came to be, and dealing with stigma. We really have to do that from the front um, because if we don't sort of set things up with compassionate self-care, we're not setting ourselves up for good mental health outcomes. And we know that patients that understand their condition and understand depression or anxiety well get better health outcomes because they understand and engage with the treatment better. They understand the medical workup and all of that. So that's consult one. And then we also go into some lifestyle um, stuff as well. So we talk about diet, exercise and sleep, all the um, lifestyle interventions, which unfortunately because of lack of resources, some GPs just don't go into. And this stuff, you know, it's evidence-based. We've researched it to the hilt and it doesn't need to be overwhelming. So we tackle all of that. And then in consult two, we deal with practical psychology skills that you can get started at home. So things like problem-solving therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy and mindfulness. And we teach you how to apply those psychological strategies to your specific problems with some reinforcing activities and worksheets to go through. And then the third consult is all about social connection uh, and suicide safety. So we talk about creating your, um, you know, work environment and your home environment to be helpful in terms of you managing your mental health. We've got a big section there, which is where I love where you guys come into this about how to support a loved one with mental health struggles and we encourage people to pull their family or their friends in to watch that one with them uh, to help creating an environment where you are safe and you are well and then yeah we deal with suicide safety which is a really 
topic and people don't want to talk about it, but we need to talk about it. Because at the end of the day, you might not be there right now, but for everyone that I see, I do a risk assessment at work and I want for everyone to have a a suicide safety plan in their back pocket. So if ever that were to happen down the track, you already know the steps of what you're going to do, who you're going to contact. You've got a good relationship with GP and people that you've already spoken to so that we don't, you know, you don't end up feeling alone like there's no place to turn. Yeah, this is um, this is so heavy, and it makes me reflect on that. Where Nathan and I we're in our mid thirties, and we're so I feel like both of us are very open about what we've experienced in this sort of space with ourselves and with our friends and with our family and stuff. But a, a few years ago, one of my grandparents, their best friend, like the the couple that they would do their double date with, killed himself, and the way that my grandparents were able to navigate the impact of that versus my mom and versus me and just the understanding and comprehension of how it had arrived at that place was so different. Um, and I feel very grateful to be part of a generation that is talking about this stuff and is um, leaning into potentially uncomfortable conversations, um, not just about ourselves, but being open to, to listening to, to friends who are like in it, going through it. Um, so thank you for being here to have the conversation and help remove even more of the, the stigma. And I feel like things like Are You OK Day and uh, Black Dog Institute and all of those things are doing really great work to sort of like uh, destigmatize. But now it's like the next st- step, isn't it? It's like, okay, let's, we know that it's okay to talk about now what are the skills that we need to talk about it and what are the next steps? So, Shiromi, um, you touched on there about the impact of our relationships and how that can impact what we've got going on in our life. And, um, you know, this show, Date Forever, is all about having an intimate relationship with ourselves and our chosen person and choosing to date ourselves for forever. So, if someone is not feeling themselves, what are some of the sort of first signs that we're at the beginning of some mental health challenges? So let's start with depression. And I should admit that depression and anxiety can come sometimes present as a bit of mishmash of symptoms, okay? Yeah. Mm. But we're looking and we're talking about symptoms like feeling perpetually sad and down. We're talking about in medical uh, terms, we've got a term called anhedonia, which means effectively not enjoying life and doing the things that you used to do. You might have enjoyed catching up with your girlfriends for coffee or going for a bike ride and you just don't want to do that anymore. You just want to stay at home. So that feeling of withdrawing. Uh, fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness, uh, reduction in concentration. Uh, Sometimes we have appetite changes, so we want to eat more, we want to eat less. And then we talk about suicide, so thoughts about suicide, thoughts about ending your life. I think the important thing to note here is that the symptoms are one thing, and anyone can Google that and look that up, but it's actually looking at how it impacts your activities of daily living, how it impacts your life. Are you having a happy, healthy relationship like you used to? Are you able to go to work and perform well? Or if you find that that's sort of starting to slip as well. So trying to have a look at the big picture of things is really important. And that's a big part of our discussion. And then with anxiety, and like I said, there's a, almost cousins of each other. We're talking about that excessive worry that you can't control. And that can permeate into sleep disturbance. It can cause a reduction in concentration, irritability, all of that kind of stuff. And like I said before, it can start to seep into relationships and work and all of that sort of thing. I think the important message to get across is that you don't need to confirm your diagnosis before you come in to see me. And I think that's a big one. People want to know, oh, what are the symptoms and how long for and all the details when actually if you've got a a gut sense that something is up or something is, you know, troubling your partner, come in and talk to me about it. Never in my 15 years of medicine have I gone, oh, that person really didn't need to come in. It's more the opposite where I've gone, bugger, I wish they came in, you know, a year or two ago even, and I could have helped them get on the right track. So don't get too caught up in the in the medical stuff that's my job to diagnose you and sort through it hey worst case scenario you don't need that and we do a review in a few weeks time and that is completely fine as well but more often than not we'll sort of do a medical workup and exclude other medical causes and then get you started on treatment so you can turn things around and start feeling better asap yeah so i know know you mentioned like earlier that one of the things that you're really excited about becoming a gp was that continuity of care and that you could see people throughout their whole journey and I know that, well, in Australia especially, it is it can be challenging to find a good GP or to find that continuity of care. Like if you move around or even doctors move around a lot as well. And so it can be really challenging to kind of 
find someone that you do actually connect with, find someone that maybe does the background research or the in-depth analysis enough to make you feel comfortable as well. So I guess, how do you go about actually finding a GP that will provide kind of that continuity of care and that you really connect with? Yeah, look, that's such a good question. I would hear this during my junior years of patients coming in saying, it's so hard to find a GP and I never got it. And I only pulled my socks up and got a GP myself when I had a little one. And then I realized, oh, this is actually a bit trickier than what it seems. And <laughs> look, the reason for that is it's quite a unique relationship. Uh, it's not just seeing someone with the professional credentials on the wall. Um, it's about seeing someone who you trust, who you connect with, someone you can have a laugh with, someone that will pull you up for being a slacker, someone you can be vulnerable with. And that's a really unique relationship. Uh, I would say that it takes a few goes sometimes, if I'm being really honest with you, and it takes you to, you know, put in a bit of effort because you need to do a bit of research, maybe, you know, look up reviews, have a chat to friends because friends are a great source of um, advice. You know, when I'm working, I often, you know, I don't disclose it because of confidentiality, but I know that this person is linked to this person whose sister saw me, whose brother saw me, who's, and it just, it, there's a big spider web there because if chances are if your mate gets along with a GP, you're probably going to like them yeah. as well. Yeah. But yeah. ideally, yeah, you want to find someone you connect with because it's really hard to open up about mental health. It's the most vulnerable time in your life. And the idea of having to open up to a complete stranger is not fun. You know, while my patients who have known me for a long period of time, they know that I'm a good egg. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not here to, you know, think that they're a failure or any of that at all. I'm here to listen to them and support them. So if you, you know, even if you're well, if you can set things up with a good GP now and, you know, find a great GP, find a clinic and where there's not just one GP, but maybe, you know, one or two GPs that you can see. So if someone goes on holiday, you've still got that backup GP. And think about things like what personality you want. I'm someone that's fairly headstrong and motivated and all of that. You might not want that. And that's fine. I might not be your cup of tea. You might want someone that's got more of a nurturing, slow approach. So think about the sort of GP that you want to connect with. It might mean that you want to connect with someone who's advocating in the LGBTQIA plus community. That's fine as well, or speaks a certain language or whatever it may be. And pick someone that fits your needs and your wants. Mm. Nathan and I have moved a couple of times um, interstate, one of them, and I, at the um, at the time that we were moving, was having some really, like, d- disruptive health issues, and I have found this really, really challenging. Um, so, yeah, and I know that even, w- like you, you sort of said, like, people are often uh, only approaching a GP once they're in that crisis or they've already, you know, they're already deep in it um, before reaching out, so I know that that can add what feels like another barrier when you're already struggling with the day-to-day. So, yeah, I, I well, like... Well, that level of urgency and you yeah. just take what you can get rather than uh, yeah. actually finding the right thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the other thing to note is, is that you can suss us out. Like, you know, women get cervical smears. You might come in for a sick note for your gastro. Try and see the same person each time or just go in to, you know, see whether, you know, for a flu shot, whether you connect with someone. You don't need to come in at the you know, the big scary mental health appointment to sort all of that out. You can do it for the little things that you see GPs for over the year. So something else that I wanted to ask you was about um, how do we get the most out of that appointment? Because like often, yeah, you've maybe done the research, you've made an appointment and fitted in around your life. With telehealth, I think it's getting a little bit easier, but maybe you've taken some time off or put it into your day. And then notoriously, I think it's like the elephant that we need to talk about. GPs notoriously running late, (laughs) then at the appointments, you know, 30, 45, an hour after you actually said it, you know, we've put in all of that effort. How do we actually get the most out of that consultation knowing that it's probably only really like a 15 minute slot that we've got to, to really get the most out of that care? Yeah, great question. So let's first attack the 15 minute slot thing. That's a no go that we're making a mistake there to begin with. We've got to book a double appointment or a long appointment with mental health. Yeah. Uh, That's really important because you want the time and not to have to feel that pressure to get all that information out really quickly. And we find that when you've got a small amount of time and you know the GP is running late, you can sort of bottle up and put on this happy interview face and Mm. pretend like things aren't as bad as what they actually are. So book a long appointment so you've got time. And the GP has got time to connect with you and listen to you and really hear what you want to achieve. Yeah. Uh, We have a mental health care plan preparation resource, which we'll put in the link show notes below, that I think can really help you because that's a preparation resource. Half the problem here is that you don't know what the GP is going to ask and that can be nerve wracking in itself. So if you have a good idea of what we're going to ask, you can prepare your answers. And actually, we encourage you to fill the form out and give it to the GP because then they can look at it collate all the information that they need quite quickly 
and then move away from the computer and actually turn to you and talk to you and connect with you, which is what mental health consults should all be about. You know, there's some really tricky questions in the mental health consult. We'll ask about symptoms and we'll ask about depression and anxiety. We'll ask about physical symptoms. And it's boom, 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 boom in terms of questions. But we'll also ask things like, oh, what do you want to achieve in the next three to six months? And if you didn't see that one coming on a Thursday afternoon randomly, it's a really full on question to answer. But actually, that question is really, really important because if we can set our treatment goals around what you want to achieve, we get the best outcomes. And it might be, you know, since we're talking about dating, it might mean to connect with your partner, you know. So I'll have my medical goals and you'll have your goals. But the beautiful thing is that three to six months when we do a review, I will actually go to you, hey, Sammy, you had on your list to connect with your partner. How's that all going? And, you know, you would have done the lifestyle stuff and started some psychological strategies. And when you turn around and go, you know what, we're going on date night now, we're communicating better and I'm finding ways to manage my stress and things are on the right path, it's this amazing positive reinforcement. And then you are like, oh, this actually works and it gives you hope and then you keep building on from there. So I think being prepared for that mental health consult and knowing what we're going to ask and use our resource um, will definitely help in terms of uh, managing that. And then regular appointments. So my patients know that for mental health, they're not coming in for a once off. It's We treat it like we do diabetes or asthma. It's a chronic condition. So I think that aspect of things is really important. And then actually the other big point to bring up, and I think as a clinician, we play a role in this as well, is that when you are coming in to see me or any GP for mental health, you are coming in to see them for your mental health. It's not on a grocery list of your rash and your pap smear and your back pain and, you know, all the other stuff. Because what Mm. happens in that situation, and I think a lot of clinicians do this, is we deal with all the physical stuff first. And I put that in inverted commas for our listeners. And then at the end of the day, you know, we've got, you know, a minute or two left and we go, oh, so you've got mental health here. You're doing okay. And you go, yeah, I'm fine. And it just gets brushed aside and we actually don't deal with it properly. So come in, book a double appointment, so a 20, 30-minute appointment, sit down and say, I'm here to sort out my mental health, I'm struggling, and that's what I want to focus on today. Leave the other physical stuff or the other complaints for another day and let's sort through this properly so we can actually sort it out. Yeah, those are all really good advice, proactive, but I think so much of it comes back to like that we need to be checking in on all aspects of our health probably more regularly than most of us are Mm. um, and not banking it up for things like going for a routine pap smear or uh, refilling a contraceptive prescription or something like that. Or not be like, oh, I'll just wait till the next time I go see the doctor. Because next time you go see the doctor, you're probably going to have like a a massive flu or something. And you're going to be like, oh, I don't want (laughs) to deal with anything else now. I just want to tackle this thing. So, totally. (laughs) So, Shiromi, I am 30. Four. 34. (laughs) Um, It's almost my birthday. So I had to just think. Um, And. I've only got one tattoo and I've got the semicolon tattoo, um, which reminds me that, um, it, it's time to take, uh, take a breath and not quit. Um, and that it's okay to take a pause and I don't have to, um, give up. Uh, and across my life, there's been like a handful of times where I've really, really struggled with my mental health, um, and my wellbeing. And like probably a lot of people, the, the last really, big dip was during the global pandemic and it was hard for loved ones to support me because everybody was going through it (laughs) like it to some to some depth in that period of time but obviously uh we were in a a 5k restricted uh radius government mandated lockdown and nath had proximity to to me and what was going on um and it was challenging for me to even know what good support looked like because all the normal things that would be available to me like getting out into nature and going for a walk or getting into the ocean or catching up with girlfriends and things that um really support you know and fill my cup were just all of a sudden those tools weren't available to me So I would love some insight on what we can do to support someone who's who's going through it and hopefully not in the context of a global pandemic. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this through the lens of daily normal life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's go through a few points. I think the first thing to do as a partner is to recognize what depression and anxiety is and be very wary of language. So the more educated you can get about what depression and anxiety is, 
the better care you can provide and support you can provide for a loved one. I think, you know, language like, oh, pull your socks up, come on, just think positively, um, all of that, it insinuates that someone chooses to have depression or anxiety and no one chooses to be in this situation. So the more you can understand that this is a medical condition and reframe your own thinking, I think will reduce judgment. And that in itself is a really, really big step. The next thing to do, I think, would be to encourage professional help. You are their partner and that is such an important role, but you don't want to take on the role of partner and doctor. You want to outsource that so that you can do your job well and I can do my job well. Now, if someone's very reluctant to see a GP, you can get them to do an online program like ours, but encouraging them to seek professional help is really, really important because it allows you then to go, okay, that GP is looking after the medical side of things and providing advice and all of that. Now I can be the supportive partner to listen, to validate and to try and be a team player, which is really hard as opposed to, you know, setting the agenda for what people should be doing and trying to forcibly tell people to do this, to do that. We talked about, we talked to people about supporting their partner with lifestyle interventions, for instance, through diet, exercise and sleep. But there's different ways that we can be supportive. And sometimes our fear and our own worries permeate into the way that we discuss that with a partner. So an example might be, you know, it might be Saturday and we're having brunch together and I say to you, Sammy, hey, Sammy, you've been a real grump recently and you cancelled dinner plans last night um, and you did Dr. Sharomi's program and she said that going for a walk would help your mental health. So why don't you go put some shorts on and let's go for a walk now, okay? Like how does that make you feel when I say that? That you're infantizing me. Yeah. Like I'm a little tri- naughty child. Yeah, it's this blame, it's this pressure, it's, you know, all the things that we don't want. While if I were to say to you, you know, that was a really lovely brunch. Hey, Sammy, um, you know, I saw the other day that there's an auction going on a few blocks away and I thought I might go for a walk and check it out. Uh, Do you want to come in and we can sort of go for a walk with me and we can do a sticky beak around and check out the home interiors and see what the median house price is going for? Do you want to come along? Oh, that might make me more depressed. Maybe not if you're buying a house, right? Maybe if if that's not on the agenda. (laughs) But if we can frame it in a way that's less pressure, right, and it's just casual and cool cucumber kind of vibes that's more likely I think to engage someone so providing the right kind of support is really important now you might say nah thanks I you know I don't want to even if I frame it as best as I could and then it's my role as a partner to go okay no problems well I'll go for a walk and maybe we can do something a bit different later and then after 100 meters I'm going to get out my phone and call my best friend Nathan and be like hey Nathan I'm having a rough time. I tried to get Sammy out of the house and she's really struggling. And can we have a little bit of a chat? Because I just need that support right now. And so the other big thing is to make sure that as a partner, you've got your own support network around you and you've got people looking after you because you can't do everything. And there's a lot of this that's completely out of your control. And so having a good support network around you and looking after yourself through, you know, diet, exercise and sleep and all that stuff is going to help you be the best partner that you can be as well. Mm -hmm. and we sort of talked about like for me there was a lot of context around what was happening in the outside world that was contributing to my mental health and how I was feeling but I think it's worth acknowledging that sometimes it doesn't have to be the external things right you could still have a great job great relationship you know be textbook in a you know good place in life and still feel unsatisfied or those feelings of hopelessness or not deriving joy from things that you would you ordinarily derive joy from and I think sometimes that's a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around where it's like everything contextually seems great Mm. like why are they so sad yeah for sure and I think that comes down to again understanding this is a medical condition I almost wish that there was a blood test that I could just quickly run for you and go (laughs) look you've got a positive result like I do a vitamin d level but there's not but there's genetic factors in play there's you know, your upbringing and cultural influences and what happened to you as a child, that comes into play. Current stresses, previous stresses, this is really complex stuff. So yeah, you can have the happy, dappy, perfect family life on the outside and be really struggling on the inside. And I think that's sometimes a lot of guilt and shame around, you know, the fact that you are struggling when everything does look okay, that can stop people from coming in. But we have to just come in and and seek that help. Yeah. And then that comparison itis thing, like, you know, I I should be fine. Like I, you know, there's people who have less money than me, who don't have a partner, who have five housemates, who, you know, whatever you might deem as like, you know, in italics, worse situation than you. And then sort of like deem yourself not worthy of that, that help and that support. And, um, I think it's, yeah, it's really hard to sort of navigate 
that sense of worthiness when there's not something you can point to, mm. to like that's, that's, you know, quote unquote wrong in your life. Um, so Sharemi, you know, we talk like on the date forever podcast talking about that intimate, um, relationship with self. What are some of the like proactive pillars that we, we can be doing to take really good care of ourself, our wellbeing and our mental health? Yeah. Great question. This is all about, you know, doing stuff when you are well to stay mentally well, I think, um, which I love. And in medicine, we talk about proaction versus reaction, and we want to start encouraging proactive care. So we do it with every other aspect of our lives. We don't go to the gym because we've just had a heart attack or a stroke. We go to the gym to prevent a heart attack or a stroke. And that's how we have to start seeing mental health. And whether you've been diagnosed or not, or you've got it, you know, in waves that comes and go, that's the exact mindset. So that's a really important thing to acknowledge. I think starting off with lifestyle, lifestyle is a really big thing. Uh, So in terms of eating the right foods, and we go through this in our program, but having, you know, reducing processed foods and having wholesome diet is really, really important. I think in terms of exercise, making sure that you get some exercise during the week. And if you're not someone that exercises, it doesn't need to be a really hard process. We can start off small and we can build. I think the problem with lifestyle is that commonly people go, oh, I've got really long hours at work and I don't eat healthy and I don't really exercise. It's all just too much. I don't even know where to start. And the key there is to just pick one little thing and start with it for a fortnight and then build on that, you know, mm-hmm. and build yeah, on that. layer so, on top. Yeah, beautiful because we find that in three to six months' time and you look back and you go, oh, wow, I'm now doing X, Y, Z. Um, so with exercise it might mean that you go for a walk around the block twice a week and just do that, you know, five days a week. Uh, you know, whatever, how many, and you might build to five days a week the next fortnight and go from there and do two rounds and you might hit the oval up and start building. It's with the same with diet, the same with exercise and even sleep. You know, there can be so many other factors that make getting a good night's sleep and, um, you know, commitments with work and kids and all of that really hard. But if we start just implementing little strategies to try and go to the bed at the same time each day, um, you know, to have a wind down routine, all of that sort of stuff. Social connection is another really big one. We need to keep good eggs and good people around us. And that work needs to be done before ideally we're you know, struggling with mental health. So having good friends around, keeping up our relationships, which is really hard in today's day and age when we, you know, converse over Zoom and we order Uber Eats and don't go out to a restaurant and share and talk and laugh together. So actively making time in your day to do those sort of things is really important. Yeah, I was actually thinking about that on demand element when you were talking about the wait times for for care. Is that that that's, we're just not used to that in anything, any other area in our life, right? You want a pizza, you want groceries, mm. you want pres- sometimes even like um, prescription medication or whatever. You can get that whenever you need it, and often you can get it delivered for a very nominal fee. You know, you need a car, it'll be there in six minutes. So then being told, oh, my gosh, you're going to have to wait weeks for something is like, what? (laughs) I'm sorry, what? Yeah, it's really interesting to put that lens of it. It's like um, having good people around you and quality relationships, you can't order that on demand. Um, And that does take – you've got to pour into those relationships – yeah, and, and build that goodwill, that trust, that mm. honesty, that openness, that vulnerability, because um, that can be really hard too is if you, you haven't had those conversations with friends while you're well to then all of a sudden want to go or need to go deeper it can be disorientating for you and the friends that you haven't yet built that relationship with. Yeah, for sure. Completely agree with you. It's It's doing the groundwork now to set things up for the future. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so Shiromi, I would love to know from a personal point of view, like what are some of the things that you're doing? What are the habits, practices, rituals that you've got to take care of your relationship with you? Yeah, beautiful. Um, I like going for a swim. That's my exercise of choice. I find it very meditative to do laps in the pool and I love the cool water. So I've found that that's the exercise that I enjoy. So I tend to do that a few times a week. Uh, I've got a Labrador named Snickers, who's just my best <laughs> friend. He's nine. And so when I am stressed, taking him for a walk or having a bit of a fur cuddle with him um, is just the best thing in the world. Uh, Catching up with family and friends is really important to me. So, you know, making the time to, it doesn't need to be anything big, going out for brunch, to be honest, or even sitting down with my um, husband and we watch maths together, which is the trash (laughs) TV that it is, and just having a laugh and you know, sharing comments and stuff like that, that's connection, right? And I'm not encouraging everyone to sit in front of the TV, but it doesn't need to be anything fancy in terms of the stuff that fills our cup. So 
trying to do the little things. Um, and then, like I was, I was telling Nathan before, that I've got a son that's just started school and he's in prep. So we do story time each evening and we read Franklin the Turtle. I'm not sure whether you know about Franklin, but we read I story- remember Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Franklin's awesome. Um, and so we read about Franklin and uh, learn some lessons together and it's this beautiful connection uh, which just brings me such incredible joy. So, yeah, thinking about what makes you happy and making sure that you spend the time to do that stuff amongst the busy day and all of that is really important. Mm, beautiful. And then my follow-on question is what are you doing to add fuel to your romantic relationship other than watching maths together? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. It's something we're constantly working on, I think, with a little child. I think, you know, he's just started school and he's a little bit older now, which makes life a little bit easier. Um we write um, cards to each other. We're really big on cards and I know that's a little oh, yeah. bit dorky, but I've got a whole box of cards that we have written to each other since we first met and about what we love about each other and what we appreciate about each other. And so um, we're big card writers, whether it's birthdays or whether it's anniversaries or whether it's just that someone's got a new job or they're going through a tough time or they've... Um, you know, helped each other. Like we just, any excuse to write a card is something um, that we do. It's a really simple thing, but receiving that from him or me writing that is just a really lovely way to sit down and to connect and to think about how amazing our relationship is and that we mean so much to each other. And it, yeah, that fills my cup a lot. Yeah, it's a great example of words of affirmation, but it's also like gifting as well. Yeah. So it ticks a few of the, uh, the, yeah, the love languages, sure. which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Sharomi, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, if there's one big like tip, recommendation, um, suggestion, habit, practice for couples to build um, in their relationship to support themselves and each other's mental health, what would it be? I think it's just to validate and listen and be there. So be the supportive friend. That's your job in, you know, in looking after each other is to always make sure that you make sure the door is open, creating an environment where that person can always come to you and always disclose that they're struggling without a fear of retribution or that you're being a burden or whatever it may be. So creating a, a relationship where the door is always open and it's, you know, filled with love and care for each other. Having tough discussions when you need to, don't be scared to have a discussion and sit someone down and ask the hard questions. I think all too often we're too scared to even broach the topic because we are so fearful that our loved one is going through a mental health struggle when actual fact if we open it and come at it with a place of validation and love and, you know, being interested in each other's lives, people will open up. And if they know that you're coming from a good egg place, they're likely to reach out for help and you can sort through this together. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And again, building that. Well, what's that beautiful quote? Like the best time to fix the roof is when the sun's out. Yeah. It's like, not, yeah. not well, it's in the middle of a storm. You yeah, wanna, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, Sharomi, thank you so much for joining us today. And to say thank you, we've provided 100 days of clean water to a student or a school um, in Zambia. Um, this project is looked after by Builder International and um, that giving has been made possible by our partnership with Buy One, Give One. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the work that you're doing um, and thank you for making that possible. Yeah, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure being here. Thanks so much, Sharomi. So if people want to connect with you or learn a little bit more about your program, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we're on Instagram uh, at the Cloud GP. Uh, people can come on there and get to know us or you can head to our website, which is www.thecloudgp.com.au. And on there, we've got not just our program for anyone with, who's struggling with depression or anxiety, but we've also got a heap of free resources. So we've got that resource to help you prepare for that GP mental health care plan. We've got a resource to help you figure out whether maybe you are struggling with symptoms and how to have conversations and all of that. So pop on there and download our free resources. And I think we can pop the link in our um, in the show notes here as well. Yeah, we Ab will. Absolutely. Sharomi, thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you for helping um, build something to bridge that gap between GP, um, mental health care plan and uh, the wait time. So thank you for addressing that problem and solving it. And just thank you for, for being here and sharing so abundantly. It's such a pleasure to be here and have this chat. Thanks, guys. This episode of Date Forever has been brought to you by Sammy Yeager and the Fueled Up Life Lab. If you want to learn more, come on over to sammyyeager.com where you can access stacks of resources to help you fuel up your life and relationships.
If you've loved this episode, share it with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an app. Thanks for joining us and adding fuel to your tank.